now yes okay thanks okay thank you everyone for the chance to uh, present uh, one of my piece of work from uh, my phd and it's really great uh, opportunity and privilege to be present to you all and i hope this will be an interacting and very important session okay i'll directly go to my presentation um, my presentation will be on the occurrence of staphylococcus aureus from dairy products in central ethiopia and see how what the implication is for food safety so this will be our, my outline for the presentation uh, just to give you a brief uh, introduction on the foodborne diseases uh, as per the definition from World Health Organization. Uh, yeah, mm, food safety, uh, I mean, foodborne illnesses are defined as uh, diseases that are usually is infectious or toxic in nature caused by agents that are you know, known to enter the human body through ingestion of food. And this could be uh, due to, uh, I mean, the etiologic agents could be bacteria, virus, and parasites as well. So just to say that, to, just to shed lights um, on, on the uh, football diseases, uh, as per the recent report released from WHO, um, the burden of football disease is depicted as, as this, and for uh, every, um, for every year, football disease causes one in 10, and there are about 30 million heads in last year, so it's good to, uh, football illnesses and most strikingly there will be uh, at least a quarter, uh, half a million days of football illnesses which for which children will account one third of the disease from disease from the football disease as well so this is um, the outbreak i mean the uh, most common uh, pathogens that are known to us be associated with football diseases as per the uh, CDC report. So this is a very striking uh, figure. So let me uh, just to go back to uh, milk quality and safety issues a little bit, just to give you a brief highlight of what's happening in terms of quality of milk and safety issues in Ethiopia. As you all know, milk represents an important uh, ingredient of uh, foods of, the, of uh, susceptible people like older age and children. In East Africa, this is common practice, specifically in the pastoral area. Milk is so important. It's daily, I mean, related to daily livelihood and also this milk is what they eat and what they drink. So, uh, so, Despite, and, and again, milk plays a vital role in transmitting zoonotic disease as well. So uh, when you see that, when we see uh, a, a, a fact from the Ethiopian side, from the total milk produce, production that we have, 71 to 97% of it is consumed through the informal market where we see uh, a lot of concerns regarding to the safety of milk that will be um, sold to consumers and again we have very much uh, very much uh, striking second low percentage of pasteurization coverage in Ethiopia and whatever milk uh, quality issue um, addressing activity that have been uh, you know in practice in Ethiopia is uh, is just a, a lactometer and alcohol test that would be performed by uh, collection centers when the farmers bring their milks to uh, the cooperatives for you know selling their products uh, as part of the milk value chain so uh, a combination of lactometer reading and thermometer reading are used as uh, a major uh, uh, you know uh, a major entity of determining the quality of milk in in the in the in the in, even in the formal market in ethiopia so uh, when we come to the uh, staphylococcus as a public health concern in milk and milk products in Ethiopia, uh, when we see the recent literatures, there is a high prevalence of uh, mastitis in Ethiopia. So usually the subclinical mastitis form where 
we cannot, uh, you know, when farmers do not usually uh, understand or know whether their milk is you know, contained, contained uh, uh, potentially pathogenous, pathogenic uh, organisms. So you know, from this uh, tremendous, I mean, the very huge amount of uh, subclinical mastitis that we see in Ethiopia, Staphylococcus aureus, as per the literatures, is believed to be associated to nearly 40% of the cases. So the combination of the uh, you know, widespread of mastitis cases in Ethiopia with the uh, great proportion of our people living in the country, uh, usually having a habit of drinking raw milk, makes uh, the, you know, you, this, uh, this concern of you know, Staphylococcus aureus in food intoxication very much important when we were investigating. So that's where we stand for research. Oh, and then the search questions that we developed was you know, what's exactly the proportion of staphylococcus as staph aureus as a contaminant in milk. And yeah, milk so products. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It sounds like there's a yeah. lot of background noise where you're at. Is yeah. it to reduce yeah. it? Ah, okay, I'll try to do that. <clears throat> yeah, there is an internet connection problem. That's why I. I have to use some some other places. Oh yeah, yeah, not understandable. Yeah. So the next question is: Does the prevalence of staph aureus cause a, an imminent concern in public health uh, that is related to the genes of classical interoxin genes and antimicrobial resistance and all those things? So the method we use was uh, a peri-urban and urban uh, dairy farms were selected. And we have uh, we happen to get something like uh, 557 samples, both raw and processed uh, milk samples, uh, for basic microbiological analysis and also modern molecular typing technique. So this was uh, the protocol we follow was uh, FDA protocol, and we went for uh, investigating a number of uh, as you see the uh, Salmonella, Listeria mononucleosis as well. But my presentation for this part will be focusing on staph locus, as I indicated in the uh, title. So we also done, uh, we have done also antimicrobial susceptibility testing for a number 12 antimicrobials for staph locus aureus. Uh, so regarding the molecular techniques that we have employed, within the extraction was done for uh, staph locus aureus and a number of molecular tests have we're done like uh, look chain test detection, make agent detection, and the novel mixy detection, and also the classical intotoxin gene detections. So we have also done a PFG analysis of uh, something like three, I mean, 32, 32 um, uh, 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 isolates to see their clonal relatedness. So, um, when we come to the result section, Staphylococcus aureus uh, isolation rate was at the rate of 20, uh, 10, close to 21%, which was fewer than previously reported. And uh, we see that we also happen to investigate, I mean, to get the uh, proportion, a significant proportion of coagulase negative Staphylococcus aureus from raw milk, pasteurized, and and um, yeah, in fact, we didn't get staff aureus, which is the most concern in terms of food safety uh, in the milk products, in pasteurized yogurt and cheese. But we were uh, we were able to see the, in a, a contamination of coagulase negative staff locus in what is deemed to be pasteurized milk that happened to be found in, in, in supermarkets and markets for direct public consumption. So this is much of a concern. And we yeah, have different proportion of staphylococcal risk prevalence from uh, milk and pasteurized milk have been reported in different countries. But we also uh, have seen to compare the number of proportion of occurrence of staphylococcus aureus between the on farm pulled raw milk and combined milk because our sampling technique involves uh, individual. A farmer bringing to the collection center on farm pulled raw milk. And also we happen to uh, sample as well 
once the collection at the collection site with the panchromic as well. So when we com when we compare the prevalence, uh, there was a, a significant uh, a difference between what, uh, the combined milk with the combined uh, raw milk being more uh, more uh, contaminated than the raw uh, pulled uh, milk. So. So when we see the milk quality assessments, what has been done at the collection site level, so when we have also tried to investigate uh, what the other issues as well. So a large majority of the farmers we've seen, like something like 90, close to 97% of them used plastic containers to store and as well as to sell meat milk to collection centers. So this is very much concern, concerning because of uh, you know, the nature of these plastic containers uh, a potential uh, source of contamination as well. So, and also when we assess the collection centers themselves, what collection, what milk quality assessments they do, 82% of them use lactometer test, and 91% of them use alcohol test to uh, to characterize the quality of the milk that the farmer brings at the collection center before they accept it. So the most important quality, uh, I mean, uh, significant uh, quality aspect of uh, raw milk submitted to the collection center was done by using a combination of lactometer and acid test. And the question here is, does it really test? I mean, this test gives a uh, milk safety issue answered. Is it really safe? Uh, so. So this is also um, very much concerning because uh, unfit milk, if the farmer bring, brought um, unfit milk that's not passed, that didn't pass the uh, test that's happening in the collection center, then the farmer has to take it back home and use it for, its, uh, for himself or herself or sell it to communities and process it as, uh, you know, local co co you know, cottage cheeses and better. And so the, as I like, I previously said that much of the market in Ethiopia is informal market, so this will be also much of the public as concern. So when we see the MR staph Staphylococcus aureus, we have also tested um, 109 Staphylococcus aureus isolates uh, from this project, and we did pretty, uh, you know, a little bit higher than 50% of uh, them were found to be phenotypically resistant to sulfoxetine. They are, by definition, MRSA, and uh, this is very much in line with other reports as well. So, uh, and also in addition, more than half of the isolates we, we tested were resistant to more than one antimicrobial uh, antimicrobials tested in this uh, assay. So when we see the molecular characterization, uh, we have also tested the NUC gene, whether the staph or is we um, characterized using biochemical tests were really staph or so that was uh, close to 110 uh, present. I mean, 110 presented Staphylococcus aureus were tested using PCR, and 109 were uh, truly positive for MUC gene. So this, so this uh, justifies uh, that uh, uh, the conventional method of Staphylococcus identification using uh, Manitol salt agar and coagulase testing will be very much helpful in, in, in settings like our Africa or, or in the, any other developing country. So among the classical uh, interotoxin genes targeted, uh, there was, at, I mean, 66% uh, of the, uh, the isolates that show at least one of those interotoxin classical interotoxin genes which are very much important in causing uh, staphylococcus associated food intoxication. So, um, so among the 70 to the isolates that we that had at least one intoxicant gene, again, 45% of them had more than one intoxicant gene. So combination of these things makes uh, the milk very much concerning. This is very much related to other workers from Brazil and other areas. So, when we see the, the occurrence or the frequency of uh, different introtoxin, classical introtoxin genes and toxic shock syndrome toxins, Staphylococcus I mean, uh, introtoxin A was the leading one in, in, in presence in occurrence, followed by uh, CEB and others. 
So uh, the leak agent detection, we have uh, found those, uh, we, we tried to test uh, uh, isolates which were resistant to sulfoxetin, uh, whether they have this basis for leak agent, but none of them were uh, positive for uh, leak agent. So we go for, we went for, we went for uh, testing the new, the new or the novel Mexi type Mexi, um, which has been reported in England in association with cattle. So again, the, our isolates were also negative for this novel type. So this is uh, one of the research areas that uh, currently we are working on to understand the genomic analysis, by genomic analysis of these isolates and what exactly the mechanism is uh, in addition to the traditionally uh, make A and make C uh, genes that are happen to be confer conferring resistance to uh, beta lactams. So uh, the, regarding the TFG typing, we run 39 isolates, like I said, and we happen to get three separate clonal types that have been uh, in other other sporadic isolates as well. So, uh, so this um, the, 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 this isolates when we see the clusters and subclusters of these uh, groups were uh, you know representing uh, two up to three different geographical areas. For example, if we take cluster B. Uh, let me show this. I think this cluster B contains isolates from a cella, cellale, and debrazate. So from three different uh, 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 areas in Ethiopia. So this tells us that there is a limited number of Staphylococcus aureus clones that happen to be uh, disseminating in broad geographic areas uh, and case causing a number of uh, mastitis cases. Is, uh, could also be, uh, could, uh, be the reason. So, uh, and the most importantly, these isolates in each cluster and subcluster, they also shared, uh, they also have a shared uh, phenotypic and antimicrobial resistance pattern, uh, which tells us that there is a common gene resistance pool, gene pool that's happening to spread in broad geographic area. In conclusion, the overall prevalence of Staphylococcus in our study was found to be 21, and 66% of our isolates were having um, at least one of the uh, classical introtoxin genes, which happened to be, uh, as per the literature, happened to be uh, responsible for uh, most of 95% of the Staphylococcus food intoxication cases. So. Um, so the most frequently encountered uh, intertoxin gene was Staphylococcus A. And regarding the multi drug, uh, the drug resistance uh, status of Staphylococcus aureus, so more than 50% of them were the, you know, MRAC at least, not typically, uh, while you know, none of them were vancomycin resistant. So, uh, I think the TFG analysis also tells, tells us that there is uh, uh, two, three clusters and of uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus that happen to be circulating in, in central Ethiopia. So our future area, research area, is to see the association of clinical manifestation of mastitis versus introtoxin combination, because our uh, uh, our comb our uh, results showed us. Uh, 3.7% of our isolates were having a combination of uh, C-type introtoxin with toxic shock syndrome gene. So there is also uh, the other research area is whole genome sequencing of then uh, the phenotypic MRS isolates that we are doing it as part, uh, as part of my postdoc research, so ongoing research uh, area. So we also like to see cross-contamination between different meat collection centers within the same geographical area, because we have seen during our field visit, uh, collection centers taking a, a common bulk tank and a common um, lactometer testing equipment using uh, using it without washing or proper uh, sanitation, using it for different uh, collection centers. So this will be one of the investigation area that we, are, we want to see and probably uh, will do it in the future.
This is a part of a research, a collaborative PhD research project between Akhul Laman Institute of Biology at Science University and Ohio State University. And funding was provided by Science University and Patel Endowment for Technology and Human Affairs of the Ohio, uh, at the Ohio State University. Thank you all for your uh, uh, attention. Thank you, Dr. Yasu. That was wonderful. Uh, again, we will hold questions for the panel discussion. So, uh, Dr. Yasu, if you could go ahead and stop sharing your screen. And then, Dr. Aseta, if you could go ahead and share your screen, you may begin. Hello. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Are you yeah, able to share your screen? Yeah, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, so it looks like it's just starting to come up. There we go. Okay. Excellent. You can begin. Okay, thank you. I am uh, Dr. Aseta Kagambega from the University of Ouagadougou. I am going to speak about uh, multidrug resistant salmonella type humerium isolated from human and, uh, and poultry. And for the uh, introduction, I can say that diarrheal disease is a serious problem uh, that causes high rate of morbidity and mortality in developing countries. These diseases are due to the lack of hygiene and sanitation and have a serious social and economic consequence that affect both individual and collective development. In Burkina Faso, diarrheal disease constitutes the second leading cause of consultation in health center after respiratory infection. And uh, among these uh, pathogens, Salmonella is the main one implicated in the diarrheal disease worldwide and also in Burkina. However, the source and transmission route of this pathogen in developing countries are poorly understood due to the lack of coordinated national epidemiological surveillance system. And uh, poultry is, of, uh, is one of the principal asymptomatic carrier of salmonella and the process of removing the gastrointestinal tract during slaughtering is one of the most important sources of carcass and organ contamination with this pathogen. Cross-contamination may occur also during preparation of, the, of their carcass, increasing the risk of contamination for the consumer. And uh, backyard and semi-intensive poultry rearing is gaining popularity in Burkina Faso but little attention has been paid to the potential negative impact of genetic pathogen associated with poultry that can be transmitted to humans throughout the poultry droppings. The aim of the study was to investigate the genome of multidrug resistant typhimurium strain isolated from feces of human and poultry in Burkina Faso using whole genome sequencing method and to compare the sequence to each other, as well as to previously uh, published genome of MDR salmonella typhimurium. About the bacterial strain, the whole genome of four multidrug resistant salmonella typhimurium were sequenced, and the strain have been described in uh, our previous study. I can say something uh, about the strain because we. We have done uh, salmonella isolation from uh, poultry feces, and also we have done uh, salmonella isolation from the hospital. Then we get uh, more than 100 salmonella serotype, but from the 
from the hospital, uh, hospital salmonella strain, we get multi drug resistant salmonella, and also from poultry, we get multi drug resistant salmonella typhimurium. And we just wanted to see if they were the same. Then we we take only four strain of salmonella typhimurium from human and uh, poultry to sequence because uh, at that time we didn't get uh, like we didn't get uh, many uh, support to do all the strain to see. Then we take this one because they were meat resistant and they get to, they have the same, uh, they were resistant to five antibiotic and it was the same antibiotic and we wanted to see what was the, the genome of the uh, typhimurium. And the strain, one of the strain have, uh, were, uh, isolated from a four years old boy and uh, the other from two years old girl, both with diarrhea in uh, Wagadou. And one of the strain, nine, eight, two, three, three, and nine, eight, nine, eight, three were isolated from faces of lost slaughtered poultry. Then the human strain were also fast type, did Two and the poultry strain were uh, DT55, 56, yes. Then the salmonella strain were tested to uh, were tested for susceptibility to 12 different antimicrobial agents using the disc diffusion method. Then the antibiotic were described as following. But for the DNA extraction, we use the MAC attract kit, the Kiagen, for the DNA wool genome extracting. Then the DNA quantity was uh, was analyzed by using uh, the qubit, and then sequencing. Sequencing was performed with a MySec sequencer. Identification of resistant gene, the, we use like a, a software, the RESFINDER web server to identify the antimicrobial resistance gene from the whole genome sequencing data. And what was the result? All the isolate were of the same sequence type. We found the sequence type uh, ST313, and they were compared with 20 isolate of Salmonella typhimurium, for which the, uh, the sequence type has been deposited in a global MLST database. Our sequence were very similar to Salmonella typhimurium, ST313 strain, isolated from patients with invasive non typhoidal Salmonella infection in Malawi, also located in Sub Saharan Africa, like Burkina Faso. And here we, we the result, this uh, show the similarity between the strain and also from other salmonella typhimurium uh, take from the gene bank. Then we can see that the blue one, the blue one, they are uh, isolated from human and the red was the isolated from poultry. And then the white, from the white, we can see that they, it was the, Salmonella typhimurium isolated from Malawi. They were all so close, and we can say that the typhimurium isolate described were resistant to five antimicrobial resist uh, to five antimicrobial ampicillin, chloramphenicol, streptomycin. Sulfonamide and three, uh, three metoprim using phenotypical method. And the rest finder, when we use to analyze the genome, also we find like uh, each salmonella was resistant to six antimicrobial. 
like in the presented in this table with the resistance gain here for its uh, uh, strain. Then uh, the sequencing data show that the S second step 313 isolate can be obtained from chicken feces slaughtered at the common marketplace in Ouagadougou, as well as from the feces of their local children. MLST revealed that the multi resistant Salmonella typhi murium isolated from poultry were genetically related to those isolated from human. And moreover, they have the same resistance gene. They have the same uh, resistance gene. And in conclusion, I will say that we found that they have, uh, they have the same phenotypical resistance antimicrobial, and we have done in collaboration with uh, uh, the University of Helsinki. I, we get a little support to go there and to, to do a serotyping and choose for strength for sequencing. Then when we sequence them, we see that they, have, they, 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 they are so close and also they were from one sequence type emerging in sub-Saharan Africa. Because the Salmonella type murium three, uh, ST, sequence type three and one three is uh, a, emerging in Malawi in sub-Saharan Africa and is multi-drug resistant also. And uh, they, had, they, they were resistant to the same antibiotic, like six to seven antibiotics then it uh, means that poultry also can be like a reservoir of this uh, salmonella, multi-resistant salmonella strain uh, emerging in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, also we, here I just put some, how the poultry is processing in uh, my country because uh, in uh, Burkina we have a, one pro the main problem is that we don't have like a slaughterhouse for uh, poultry and the poultry slaughtering is just from each local market, like the traditional market. From each market, you can see like uh, one seat where they are uh, slaughtering poultry for uh, selling. Then uh, this is uh, like the process this like uh, slaughtering and after slaughtering they put them on the floor and this uh, processing and after that they put them like in one place we without any eyes and for selling this is ready in the plate is uh, it's ready for selling and the like this water is uh, for many many carcasses before to change water and sometimes some of them they don't have any idea if water can be changed or not or should be changed or not and in the same place like they are doing processing of poultry they are selling also uh, ready to eat poultry sometimes because you can see here they this is to do the plucking first but after, when they get the carcass, they have other, other, uh, other plates for uh, grilling. Grilling at the same place, they can have carcasses, real carcass, and also grilled carcass. And when you come to the market, you just go there. If you want carcass, you take one real or, or grilled uh, carcasses. And uh, we, we have done this to, to, to get some data to say to the authority that we should organize this uh, market because it can be like, uh, we can get some emerging pathogenic bacteria from this processing. If we, we don't know that they can have a, a many, many pathogenic bacteria to contaminate the consumer. And uh, thank you for your attention. Hello. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, All right. Um, 
Well, it looks like we can go ahead and get started with our panel discussion if our panelists and moderator are ready. Okay. Great. All right. So, Dr. Iyasu, are you also prepared? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Then, if you have a question, we ask that you please raise your hand and then we'll go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, hi, this is uh, Barb Kowalczyk. I don't know if you can hear me, um, mm -hmm. but I wanna thank our panelists for uh, two very great uh, presentations. And I wanted to also let you know that, uh, raise your hand if you have a question, um, or you can also post in the Q&A. But um, Laura, I can't see if anybody has their hand raised or not. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I will go ahead and um, let you know. And is it all right if I just read you the name and unmute them? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm not sure why you can't see them. Oh, but I can see them now. All right. So, oh, great. Okay. Can I unmute them? Yep. So Ari Havilar? I'm struggling with how to unmute Ari. Um, I will go ahead and I, I he's unmuted now. Um, yeah. uh, please, Laura. Ew, yes. You know, I don't know if uh, vacation is on my presentation or for Dr. Uh, the first uh, communicator. Um, I'm sorry, what? I just want to see, to know that if vacation is on my presentation first or not. Oh, no, so we're going to be discussing both presentations now, taking questions okay. for both. Okay, thank you. Because oh. I have some question for the for doctor uh, from Ethiopia. <laughs> okay, no, that's great. That's perfect. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, I guess maybe start with questions from the audience and then we can discuss uh, with questions between the panelists as well. Okay. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is uh, Ari Havala from the University of Florida. Um, I said I was very interested in your uh, presentation. Uh, you may know that uh, there's another project, uh, Pull Push, that looks at uh, poultry in uh, Burkina Faso. So the data that you presented are, are very interesting as, as a background. Um, I, I noted that you were able to find genetically very closely related salmonella typhimurium strains from humans and from chickens. But in your method slide, you mentioned that the phage types were actually uh, very different. Um, and traditionally, I, I haven't sort of looked at the, the links between traditional phage typing and, and whole genome sequencing, uh, but it's surprising because phage types have always been understood as being very different. Um, so did you check um, the phage typing results uh, that, that you had? And can you explain why these different phage types are so closely genetically related? Um, yes, uh, thank you for your question. I will say yes, but uh, I think that the phage type, they were different. And we we conclude that fast type was not so uh, is not very uh, very I don't know how to say I, I it's not uh, it cannot uh, say like a genetical decide for the genetical uh, relation from the strain I don't know if you you understand what I want to say yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, again, I haven't looked at the literature, but um, I mean, fast typing has been used to track outbreaks uh, for mm -hmm. decades uh, before uh, PSGE was was available. Uh, so I was just wondering what the general uh, mm -hmm. experiences are, but uh, just flag that as a an interesting finding. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, the next question is from Getnet Yimmer or Getnet Ali. Go ahead, Getnet. Yeah. Getnet. 
Yes. Okay. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. So, yeah, thanks very much. Getting that humor is my name. I'm uh, from the Ohio State Global One Hills Initiative, and I would like to thank the organizers for honoring the the Food Safety Day and, and all the presentations in line with that, and congratulations for all that. And in line with what I just said, World Food Safety Day, it means that we need to do something for the community. So for both presenters, I want to know wonderful and great presentation, but I want to know more about what has this got to do with the community who has given you all the sample, who has you know, contributed for the science. So have we done anything to the community beyond the interest of science so that the community at the end benefits? Again, thinking of the World Full Safety Day, over. So, um, Iyasu or Asena, would you like to, um, to... Yes, yes I think, uh, thank you for uh, your question. I think that, yes, because uh, when we get the result, uh, we, we try to make like a workshop where we, in Burkina, after uh, making this result, we, we get like a workshop with... Uh, with people, with different actors, like first one of the association of consumer and uh, also uh, with uh, association of, uh, of a poultry processor. And uh, we, during this workshop, we ask like the Ministry of Health to come and follow. We present many, many other results about food safety, about but yes, but, uh, I think it's not enough. We need to, to, to communicate. We need to do some more training on like uh, to go from to, to the poultry processors seat and explain some good hygienic practice and uh, to, to communicate more and more. Then we are uh, looking for uh, a support because when you in the problem is that in my country when you are speaking about a, the quality of uh, of food they say that you don't have enough food first you have to get enough before to speak about the quality and uh, that is our problem here and but i think that uh, more and more results we will get how to to to, to speak about how to, to discuss with the authority to, to make like a, a regulation of food because we, the problem is we don't have a, like a local regulator for food, like a institution for food regulation. We don't have anything like that because they think it's not a priority. The priority is first to get more, more to, like enough food first. But diarrheal disease is a, something, it's a reality, and we need to do something about that. Infection disease is uh, enough uh, from the population, and then we need to do something. Then uh, for the community, we, we have a plan for training in, in uh, like in many languages, like native languages to develop and explain how to avoid food contamination and uh, food contamination is uh, what is the consequence also of food contamination. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Asada. And uh, that, I mean, that brings up a very good point and that's something that we've kind of in the food safety community really battled with over the years is um, this idea that food security outweighs uh, the needs for food safety, but you know, one of the things that I think we as a community need to work on is how to communicate that better because if the food is not safe, it will not provide food security. Um, I wanna give Yasu a chance to answer um, GetNet's question before I jump to the next, uh, the next question in line. We have several, so thank you, Yasu. If you could spend just a minute or two responding to GetNet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Gittendet, for the very important question that you raised. Uh, my answer regarding to your question will be pretty much the same like uh, 
my colleague from Burkina Faso has already mentioned, pretty much all of those issues she raised uh, works very much to our situation as well. But to just to uh, tell you what, what really happened during that time, uh, after we get these results, what uh, we did was we tried to communicate the uh, 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 cooperative uh, there is a milk cooperative uh, at Salale, at uh, Chancho, Chancho Town in Salale. So uh, we also, there is also a milk cooperative at uh, Devrazade. So we just uh, communicated the results, the preliminary results of our finding to the cooperative uh, lead persons. So at that time, what we discussed was we, I had a personal discussion with uh, each person. So they were, the idea was just they will be uh, preparing training based on the findings because you know those most important findings regarding to the you know milk hygiene basic milk hygiene and other things were discussed and they told me that they told me that this is going to be very much useful when they do uh, trainings because pretty much they, they do this this uh, kind of training for their members uh, very much uh, frequently uh, in different aspects. So they, they told me that this would be going to be taken as one of the inputs for uh, training the uh, dairy farmers. But in general speaking, like you put it, research in most, most of the cases in Ethiopia, especially when it's done by a student, will be done and put on, on the shelf. Uh, so no one will, know, will be going to see it, uh, you know, it's going to be a dead end uh, there. So, but this trend, like Dr. Barbara mentioned, will be uh, should be changed. You know, we know we have to. Uh, you have to make make sure that we properly communicate uh, the farmers after the finding and any beneficiary for that matter, whatever research has been uh, done. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Yasu. And just before I jump uh, to the next person in line, I mean, one of the things that, uh, just following up on your point, Yasu, is sometimes these projects get written up and put on a shelf, right? But there's valuable data there that could be used, not for, um, you know, not for definitive uh, studies, but, you know, for exploratory analysis. So one of the questions I actually had for you, Yasu, is you collected 577 samples from um, urban and peri-urban uh, dairy farms. And it seems like you collected information on their practices, various practices. Um, in your analysis, and I know the results you presented here focused on um, antimicrobial resistance, but did you actually look at it, whether or not any of those were risk factors, any of those practices were risk factors for um, for prevalence of salmonella um, or specific antibi antibiotic res or antimicrobial resistance patterns? And did you look at the difference between urban and peri-urban? Um, even if it was a not, you know, even if the study wasn't designed to do that, we could use that information to garner some uh, preliminary results that we could use to inform a larger study. And so I think um, just building on what you said, uh taking making use of the data that and that's already being collected and seeing what we can glean from that to inform future studies would be really important yeah oh hey barb do you want me to respond yeah yeah just quickly yeah, and we'll yeah. Th thank you questions. okay yeah like you said uh, in fact we have tried to gather as many information as possible using a structured questionnaire regarding their practices so in fact, I had one publication on the risk factors associated with the recovery of Staphylococcus aureus from milk. So uh, we also done, we've done also a, a number of statistics uh, like a multiple um, regression analysis of uh, different variables associated with recovery of, recovery of Staphylococcus aureus from milk and uh, milk, specifically from the raw milk. Uh, so what we have found was there were, uh, there were a number of risk factors that uh, that were very much related to the, the you know, the recovery of uh, Staphylococcus, like uh, the timing of the milking and the distance and the type of milk, uh, milk base that they use, whether it was, whether it was plastic uh, that was designed for another purpose or was it from, uh, is, was it for, from of aluminum that, that, that's easy, wishable. 
So there were a number of issues that we have addressed in that, in that uh, aspect as well. In fact, I didn't present that one here. Thank you. That, that's okay. I just wanted to know if it had happened. All right, moving on. Uh, Yatagala, please go ahead. Yeah. So are you with me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Bar uh, Barbara. So my name is Yitagal Tarrafa from Harmaya University, Ethiopia. Uh, I would like to thank uh, both presenters and uh, I have a question for Dr. Yasu. So regard to for the antibiotics, which is a phenotypic resistance, uh, almost you get 53% on phenotypic, but you didn't get uh, any of MACA gene. Uh, I have a question, why is this? because we didn't see any of the MACA gene expressions. And also, have you checked MACA, MACC gene um, at the same time? And the other maybe a comment or something you can uh, give uh, your suggestions. Uh, regard to the risk factor for antibiotic resistance, it is one of the cases, the use of uh, antibiotics. So I saw some resistance uh, profile of some papers which are published on Salmonella, even on Staphylococcus, which are showing that a resistance for certain types of uh, antibiotics, which are not used uh, in Ethiopia, both in veterinary sectors and also in uh, human medicine. So can you say something about why this can happen? Just it is a suggestion. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Itagan. Nice to hear about your voice. Um, uh, um, regarding to your question, uh, those uh, genotypically MRSA or methicillin resistant staph aureus, but uh, genotypically lacking MEK agent, uh, were one of the fascinating that uh, uh, really uh, was uh, a driving force uh, uh, pursuing to understand uh, what uh, really is happening in terms of the genome. Uh, and that's uh, really one of the important questions that we are currently trying to answer. But uh, to, just to say, just to respond to your question, we have tested make agent. They were totally negative for make agent. We have done this repeatedly. We have also tested for make agent. They were also negative. So this has to be, um, probably this has to be related to the, you know, some sort of a new mechanism of, uh, yeah, resistance that's happening because you know pathogens, specifically bacteria, are known to you know evolve as quickly uh, as they can to you know to leave us behind in terms of understanding how they are you know uh, trying to cheat uh, the, the 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 treatment mechanism that we are uh, uh, wisely defining to uh, tackle them. So they, they are. Uh, these are really important question, and we are trying to understand how what the what the molecular mechanisms are behind this type of phenotypics. You know, but these are not uh, unique in terms of you know specifically considering the these sources. These isolates are have uh, you know recovered from animal sources, so we have this type of uh, um, uniqueness uh, or unique mechanism of. Uh, Antimicrobial resistance uh, in in animal in, in 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 the in the animal sector. So, uh, regarding the antimicrobial consumption, uh, I mean the antimicrobial resistance in the in Ethiopia, in the animal sector, as far as I know, uh, I don't think we have enough information. Uh, how much? Uh, I mean, uh, yes. In fact, one of the questions we asked our uh, participant farmers was whether they have, whether they have used any antibiotics for treatment of their cows. And then they, surprisingly, 80% they, they, of them uh, responded that they have used some sort of antibiotics, which uh, we were not able to identify with the, which type of uh, antibiotics they use, but there was a rampant uh, practice in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the community, in the rural setting uh, uh, to treat animals using even uh, drugs designed for uh, for uh, for uh, humans like tetracycline, human tetracycline, uh, also and other drugs as well. So this is very much important, uh, you know, untapped 
uh, research area in Ethiopia to understand really, uh, not only understand, but understanding and generating enough information, what the practices are and devising uh, an intervention based on those findings. So we, the, 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 the idea of working together with you know, this is the one whole approach of tackling things uh, like antimicrobial resistance is very much highlighted in this regard. So we anticipate that more works to be done in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Iasu. So we have several questions. Um, next up is Robert uh, Ansara. Go ahead, Robert. Thank you very much. Barbara, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. And thanks really uh, very much for moderating this session. And uh, thanks uh, for Dr. Yasu and uh, Dr. Aseta for really, really very wonderful uh, pre two presentations uh, that are really uh, also tie in uh, very well with the World uh, I mean, uh, Celebration of the World uh, Food uh, uh, Safety Day. Uh, so my, I have two questions. Uh, the first question goes to Dr. Yasu. Uh, Dr. Yasu, uh, your data, uh, you present a very interesting data on uh, antimicrobial resistance patterns uh, for the staff hours that you isolated from uh, milk samples. Have you compared this data with the, that uh, from clinical samples from human beings? And uh, do you have any observations, especially uh, from uh, maybe Ethiopia in particular and maybe East Africa uh, in general? The, uh, the second question goes to Dr. Seta. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, you reported in your work that you're isolating Salmonella typhimida that is actually ST313. Uh, you may have uh, maybe read from literature that we've uh, done uh, some work uh, in, in, in Kenya, in Kemri, uh, where I work, Kenya Medical Research Institute, um, and we reported the predominantly ST313 uh, from clinical isolates. Uh, so may I know uh, whether you did the whole genome sequencing or you just uh, did the uh, MLST using the seven house keeping genes? Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, you and I should have introduced, I should have introduced myself. Uh, my name is Rob Tausare. I work at Kenya Medical Research Institute in Nairobi. I'm also a postdoc fellow with the Ohio State University's Global One Health Initiative. Thank you very much. Over to you, Bob. Okay, uh, Iyasu, do you want to go ahead? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robert. Uh, nice to see, to hear your voice as well uh, for your question. Thank you. Um, you raised a very important question. One of the issues that we currently face in Ethiopia is uh, we don't have enough, enough information regarding, you know, you know, uh, you know, to compare across the human and animal sectors, but so, as far as my knowledge is concerned, when, when it comes to MRAC or methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus, you see uh, uh, a higher prevalence of MRAC, which was true in our case as well, uh, in animal sector than in human sector. In human sector, you find different literatures depicting the prevalence of MRAC from clinical isolates ranging from 45 up to 81, but there are some questions regarding to the methodology and other things. But recently, we are also trying to, uh, uh, to, to answer this question, whether we have this much uh, MRSA, medicine resistance staff or is proportions in the human sector. So one of our fellow, uh, our fellow Raja, our worker is working on clinical, uh, clinical isolates of MRSA. So uh, as per our uh, present, um, preliminary result we have, we have only 60%, 6%, which is very much low, what have been uh, reported in different uh, literatures of MRAC. So uh, there is uh, a lot to understand, uh, but, uh, uh, but obviously for, for obvious reasons, because of uh, you know, this uh, animal, uh, uncontrolled animal uh, antimicrobial use in the animal sector, we, we see, it's not surprising to see an increased proportion of resistance from the animal sector uh, compared to the human. So that's my, 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 my evaluation so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Robert, you said you had a second question? Uh, yes, yes, uh, for Dr. Seta. 
Yes, uh, thank I, you. I, 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 did you get the question? Or, otherwise, I could repeat it again, Dr. Seta. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was asking that from your presentation, I, I observed that uh, you are reporting uh, uh, salmonella type mediums that you are isolating uh, from uh, that you are isolating from uh, poultry that uh, belong to a, a sequence type 313. Uh, so I was uh, wondering, uh, you may also, you may have read uh, literature from uh, publications from Kenya that we published, uh, our group from Kemri. Uh, we reported uh, uh, salmonella type mirror strains predominantly uh, from human uh, isolates. Eh? We've not reported any uh, from, uh, uh, you know, poultry. So I was wondering, and this, uh, the, our data was based on whole genome sequencing. So I was wondering uh, from your data, did you do whole genome sequencing or used the uh, MLST using the seven housekeeping genes. Uh, that was my question. Uh, over to you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Robert. I think that it uh, we we have done the wool genome sequencing, and uh, we use the wool genome sequencing to analyze the MLST from the wool genome sequencing data. Uh, you have a online software you can use to get the MLST. Is okay. it okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you very much. That's very, very interesting data. Thank you very much. Looking forward to read your publication. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you. So our next uh, next question comes from, and I apologize if I don't pronounce this correctly, Debasu Gela, you're, you are um, unmuted. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I might have stepped away. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next question. Uh, is from. Hello. Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm now sorry. we can hear you. Okay. So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, board presenters, for your interesting presentation. And uh, I have one question, which will be uh, toward this, uh, Dr. Yasu. So it is regarding the isolation of uh, non. Uh, uh, coagulase negative uh, staphylococcus from uh, pasteurized uh, milk sample, if I'm not mistaken. So if that is the case, uh, which, what do you think is the cause of that positive uh, or isolation of the non uh, coagulase negative staph aurus? Is that due to uh, failure of pasteurization or uh, lack of efficiency of pasteurization or is that Post pasteurization contamination, have you come across with the possible source of um, the, the staph aureus, uh, I mean, coagulase negative uh, staphylococcus uh, from pasteurized uh, milk products? Thank you. Yasu? Thank you, Tabasu, for the nice question you raised. Uh, in fact, this is uh, uh, very much surprising uh, uh, to see uh, coagulus negative staphylococcus or is isolates contaminating uh, like things like uh, dairy products like pasteurized milk, cheese, and yogurt. So one of the, uh, uh, the reasons I, I believe would be faulty pasteurization because uh, not only we found uh, non uh, uh negative staphylococcus aureus, but we also found listeria monocytogens, which is very much uh, worrisome in terms of, you know, the behavior or the uh, inherent behavior of the pathogen uh, that you find it more uh, in, in, in refrigerated foods and for longer period of time producing in that food and causing uh, uh, very much fatal diseases, specifically in the risk group like uh, pregnant women and elderly and children with low uh, uh, compatible immune systems. So um, one of the questions, one of the reasons I, 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 I believe would be the faulty pasteurizations because, uh, and again, as you might probably know, uh, in Ethiopia, we don't have a system that can regularly, you know, check and balance uh, 
uh, whether a given milk processing plant is strictly following uh, following the, the required mandatory system to make sure that the product they are distributing is safe in terms of you know those uh, pathogenic microorganisms so uh, we, we, well, you know there is a, a regulatory body ifda currently used to know daca but now ethiopian food and medicine authority they kind of give you a certificate for establishment and i was asking one of the the, the, co the colleagues there whether they have any mechanism to check once they certify a certain processing plant and you know it's a post market assessment kind of thing i think it's not it's not practice so this, there are many pitfalls that you can mention and also with this uh, the post uh, post pasteurization contamination could also be one of those hygienic issues that will be addressed by regulatory bodies and i hope i think this is this could be the reason if i properly answer your question thank you thank you very much okay thank you um the next uh, question comes from, uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Derese Daka. Um, you should be allowed to talk now. And I see also in the Q&A box, you have several questions. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Thank you. Hello. Yes, we hear you. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Sadaka from Ethiopia House. Yeah, are you hearing me? Yes. Hello. Yeah, I'm Mawasa here in Awasa University here in Ethiopia. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Dr. Both of you are uh, making good information for us. Uh, for the first presenters, I had one research that I did uh, Eight years back about um, antibiotic resistance, especially sufferers on the source of milk, and I published in, in known journals, but I, I didn't compare with some uh, other animals and some human source infection. But the source of infection during that time, the main source of infection is that is a bucket and the farm level, not a kid. But did you observe it about the source of infection about the sufferers? Where is the primary source of this uh, sufferers infection or contamination? Is that really from the fetus of animals or where? And then I think I observed from your presentation, there is alcohol production from the milks, up kinds of the milk. So is there any effect of alcohol on the sufferers? So sometimes some chemicals are killing some organisms. So what is the effect of alcohol there? Moreover, did you observe any source of infection? Well, I actually asked you that. Did you compare the human infection for infection for human beings? Can we judge that way? And then lastly, uh, what was the effect of pasteurization here? I observed it before pasteurization and after pasteurization, totally pasteurized. Pasteurization uh, removes staphylococcus, but other organisms are not, for example, mm, gram-negative bacteria are surviving there in the uh, milks after package. So is there any information that mention about this, the effect of pasteurization? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, Yasu and Aseta. Uh, Yasu, you want to go first and then we can have Aseta weigh in? Okay. Thank you. So thank you, Darese, for your question. And uh, just to say, to respond to your question uh, regarding the source of infection, uh, like I, I made it clear from my presentation, our uh, sample for Staphylococcus aureus recovery was milk and milk uh, dairy products, like milk and pasteurized milk, cheese and yogurt. So we, we our sample source is uh, mm -hmm. um, from the dairy uh, farmers. It was not done uh, from individual farm, um, individual animal from farm, but it was a pulled a farm pool sample. Once the uh, the farmer, you know, milked the milk and brought it uh, to the collection, so that's exactly where we collect our sample. We have 
two categories. One is uh, uh, on-farm pulled milk, and the other one is the bulk milk from the collection center. So we never check back on, on, uh, on individual farm. That's one of the limitations of this study. And that will not be, you know, because of this limitation, we're not able to conclude. I mean, uh, just to say words about mm -hmm. what was the source of the infection. But from the literature, as you may see, the uh, mastitis, mastitis is a common, commonly, uh, common, common, uh, special, especially the subclinical mastitis form is commonly reported in Ethiopia, in which 40% of them in most, in, in, in some literature say, 40% of those mastitic cases are attributable to Staphylococcus aureus. So, uh, yeah, so this could be one of the, 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 the reason, I mean, the source of contamination. But again, not to forget that the, also the personal hygiene was uh, starting from the farm to the collection center. And regarding the pasteurization, yes, technically we believe that pasteurization will eliminate most of pathogenic microorganisms and also spread back microorganisms, bacteria. But there are still some, some issues that, that reporters have to depict some of some organisms escaping this, uh, this technique and uh, becoming very much impo important in terms of public health. But one of these issues is like I previously mentioned, we don't, since we don't have a regulatory body that can control uh, these systems, this, um, resist, uh, these uh, milk processing plants. And if proper hygiene and sanitation uh, or other mechanisms uh, uh, like uh, HSCCP has not been properly done in milk processing plants, so what we expect is because of the nature of some organisms like the steria monocytogens who can f uh, make a biofilm there and can resist uh, you know, high temperature and other chemicals. So, and the other thing you mentioned is that regarding the alcohol, I never, I mean, I didn't say that there's, there's a mixing of alcohol with, uh, with uh, the milk. I mentioned alcohol and lactometer, one of uh, the methods that they use at the collection centers for, you know, classifying or defining whether the milk was, you know, acceptable for uh, for them or not. That's an acceptable. They taste the alcohol test used to check whether the milk the farmer bringing to the collection center has not been over fermented. If it is over fermented, it's fermented. That means it is uh, waited a long time. Then you see a kernel or you know a breaking up of the, the milk when you mix it with uh, with uh, with alcohol and lactometer tests the density, the specific gravity of the milk, whether the milk has been adulterated using water or not. So they, they, they check this, they use these criteria to accept or reject milk from uh, dairy farmers in their collection center. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I know uh, I wanna, we, it looks like we have, oh, it went away, but looks like we have a question from, Tamaru, um, did I mispronounce that? Uh, I can go ahead and read it, or if you raise your hand, I can allow you to talk. Okay, so the question, and actually I think this is a good question for both of our speakers, and I'd like Aseta to answer first since uh, she hasn't had a question in a while. Um, but the question is, are there many, are there any well-established food inspection risk assessment models in place in, um, in, um, in your country. So in Ethiopia and Asete for you in Burkina Faso. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tamara, if you want to, I'll go ahead and allow you to talk. If you want to go ahead and uh, clarify your question a little bit. Hey, good morning or good afternoon everyone. This yeah. is Tamara from uh, Maryland. Um, it's very interesting to see that both presentations and I was wondering if uh, we have currently uh, any risk-based food inspection models or any kind of certification models that enhance uh, uh, prevention of certain pathogens or any, uh, um, I would say, certification criteria in order to uh, validate uh, uh, different food processing establishments. Thanks. 
So Aseta, do you want to go ahead and, and yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, we, the problem is that we don't have a local food regulators. And uh, we, we are uh, working to, to get the data and to, to get some partnership and uh, to, build, to build some regulation. At the moment, we don't have, like, uh, we have, like, inspections services of hygiene. They say something like that. But this, uh, this institute, when they, it's very little, and when they go out, they are just uh, going to the, to the markets and some little shop to see if, like, the conserve the ready to eat concept like a goose or uh, tomatoes if they, they if they are expired or not but they just uh, they are looking for uh, expired or not, something like that from the shops and everything. but from like inspection for uh, food uh, microbiologicality not yet so I said that this is um, Barb, and I had a follow-up question on that. So, um, is is it? What are the barriers to setting it up? Is it um, is it going back to your question that they're more wor or your comment earlier that they're more worried about food security than food safety? Is it a lack of awareness of the burden of food safety or foodborne illness? Is it? Um, lack of funds, is it lack of capacity, or is it all of the above? So, I mean, trying to understand, you know, what, what is uh, preventing some of the uh, collaborations and data sharing that you mentioned earlier, or investments in, in investments in food safety? Okay, I... Yeah, I think that you, it's a question maybe I misunderstood. Okay, well, I was just wondering, you said that, um, you know, mm -hmm. people, people, there's not a food safety risk assessment uh, model and there's lack of data and things like that. And I was just wondering what the barriers were. Yes, yes. So could you comment on that, what the barriers are to um, implementing and developing those models? Yeah, well, yes, I think uh, at the moment we are, uh, we, we are working on uh, food safety, foodborne pathogen, but uh, we don't have a clear plan at the moment to for the risk assessment of food, not yet. But uh, we, we, we are this on like a, a future project we need, we are working with, uh, we need some partner to help us to build something. Okay. Because uh, from the authority we try, but it's not, not a priority yet. But we, 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 we like uh, as a microbiologist, we know that it's a necessity. It's very needed for, for, for now, but for the Ministry of Health, they say not now, but they, are, they have some project about global, uh, like uh, not global, uh, One Health. They, have, they are speaking about the One Health project in Burkina Faso but uh, they are not doing a prevention like i don't understand the one help they are speaking about because i don't see anything any concrete like uh, they didn't do anything yet okay. but they yeah. they put too many many ministries together and they speaking they are speaking one help but they don't understand really the one help they, they want to do then we are looking about that and sometime when we get a meeting, we try to explain what is our plan, but it's some political now things then. Wow. 
great. Yasu, would you like to um, respond to Tamara? Yeah, uh, if I have, uh, yeah. Um, uh, as you know, in Ethiopia, we, we, we don't even have, uh, you know, uh, properly designed food, po food safety policy. And you know, food safety has even never been, you know, has never been an issue. Uh, in, in fact, I remember when I was um, trying to, foc uh, trying to uh, tell my friends about my topic of my research, when I told them that my research focuses on food safety, one of my friends said, I don't, I, don't, I don't forget what he said to me. He said, we're a country where there is food insecurity. How come you talk about food safety? So they, this is uh, the most, uh, you, what you see in terms of you know, uh, the community and also what we see in terms of what we have done so far. But currently, we're trying to you know, push forward. Yeah, as PHA, we're trying to at least understand the situation and prepare uh, a roadmap where food safety uh, issues are now and where we should want to be in terms of you know, inter uh, you know, addressing the, uh, the problem of food safety in system-based approach. Uh, say, for example, like you know, one of the, our project, the Tatari project, would be a nice example, a nice startup for understanding, you know, for making things uh, uh, in proper manner to you know have a to properly address the food safety issue that we are immensely facing in terms of economics and public health right and and um i agree it, it's one of the challenges is understanding the burden of foodborne disease and making sure people are aware of that and then you know the risks that are present um did uh let's see do we have we it looks like we have no more open questions and we only have i think laura five or six minutes left um so yeah. i so i didn't know if we wanted to give the panelists um uh just a last last word if they had anything they wanted to say or react to um during the q a that they didn't get a chance to yeah, and I think Oseta had a question as well for Dr. Uriah. Oh, yes, that's, I, I'm sorry, I forgot about oh, that. No, that's, this is perfect, so. Aseta. Hello, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I think that my question was, um, well, I, I get my answer uh, from the other uh, question. Okay, and did you have yeah. any any last uh, last thoughts that you wanted to share based on the Q and A? Okay, I think uh, I would like to to thank uh, all of you, Laura and the panelists and uh, the other participants, and also to thank my colleague from Ethiopia, the presenters, Dr. Yasu and uh, and say it was very interesting <laughs> the presentation and question thank you thank you um iasu do you have any last thoughts um or reactions uh th thank you laura um i don't have much to say but i would like to thank for for you know thank you all of you the panelists and the, the attendees for this uh the, presentation and one thing I would like to emphasize in terms of uh, food safety issue in Ethiopia is that there is a lot of things that we have to do and I really appreciate the question that I, I, I happen to get from the audience, the attendees and uh, I see a lot of uh, Ethiopian colleagues very much interested in, 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 in the areas of food safety but, uh, but I would like to, as, as, as a member of, I mean, as a staff at EPHI, I would like to extend my uh, open heart for all of you to join us in addressing this issue because uh, we are trying to currently we are, uh, we have, we are initiating a, a food safety roadmap uh, document preparation. So I would be if you are if you are, if you allow me to take this chance to ask you request you to uh, you know to uh, just to put your hands on this document and we'll be sharing you. Uh, 
to just get at least understand the problem and uh, want to see where exactly we want to be in terms of you know food safety issues and how we want the government to understand the problem and how to uh, at least win the confidence of our politicians in understanding you know the problem as much as they do in terms of food security thank you for the chance well, Iyasu and Aseta, thank you very much for a great seminar. And and I I would just like to echo Iyasu's comments there. And I think that's one of the reasons that FAO, um, well, the United Nations, um, WHO, FAO, um, created World Food Safety Day was that we they are recognizing that we need to raise awareness that this is a, a, an important problem that needs to be addressed. And I think the thing that um, always strikes me and when I'm talking to people about food safety and, and you know, um, <clears throat> I've often heard over the course of my career, well, we need to get enough food into people. We need to make sure that they're getting sufficient nutrition. Um, and, you know, my response typically is, is food is not secure or nutritious if it isn't safe. But I think one of the things that I've noticed since the World Health Organization burden of disease estimates came out, which Yasu had presented at the beginning of his talk, is that um, 600 million uh, people are sick and globally, um, 100 and, uh, or I'm sorry, 420,000 die and 33 million healthy life years lost. And if you look at that 33 million healthy life years lost, that is <clears throat> probably that's de almost definitely a low estimate, um, but because many foodborne, not all the foodborne pathogens were included in that. Um, but you know, when when people hear that, that doesn't resonate with them. But when you start to tell them that that is on par with malaria and tuberculosis, the burden of foodborne disease is in the same um, similar magnitude to malaria and tuberculosis. And look at all the efforts that we put in to fighting malaria and tuberculosis that has changed the conversation, at least the conversations that I've had. So um, I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, Laura, I, I know we only have, it's 10 o'clock promptly. Um, I'll turn it back to you to end out. And I wanna thank everyone, especially our, our presenters, everyone who asked a question and all of our attendees today for, for joining this important conversation. Laura? Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Wonderful presentations and wonderful discussion. And thank you, Barb, for the wonderful moderating. Um, and uh, we'll just go ahead and announce that next uh, our next webinar will be July 16th. And we will be having Dr. Lonnie King and Dr. Barney Graham presenting on COVID-19 and how it relates to One Health. Um, so thank you for joining us and we look forward to talking with you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.